You're listening to the Cat Breeder Sensei Says Podcast, the show that supports the reputable breeding of pedigree cats. I'm your show host, April Petito, and in this episode, we're going to meet Pearl Frazier from Pearl's Ragdoll in Texas, but right after this short message. Do you want to learn how to become a successful breeder of pedigree cats? Now you can. For the first time ever, enroll in an online training course that takes you step-by-step through everything you need to know to get on the right track. Visit catbreedersensei.com to sign up today and use code PODCAST21 to get $25 off. All right, so let's get started with Pearl Frazier. She is from Pearl's Ragdolls, and she has agreed to be a guest on our show today and share with us information about her beautiful choice of pedigree cat, which is the Ragdolls. So thank you, Pearl, for coming on to uh, the show to talk to us today. Yeah, thank you, April, for having me. You're welcome. Uh, So I know that you breed Ragdolls, and it's always interesting to me, like how people choose their, you know, their breed. And I saw a little bit on your website about your story, you know, but um, just for our listeners, tell us, you know, how you got started with ragdolls and maybe a little bit about their personality. That's one thing I like about pedigree cats is that I think they all have their own little personalized set of traits and things that make them different from another breed. So for people who aren't familiar with ragdolls, maybe this can be an opportunity for them to learn about the ragdoll. Yeah. So in 2019 was actually when I got my first pedigree cat and he's technically actually not a ragdoll, but he has a very similar um, demeanor as them, very similar temperament, which they're kind of known for having a very calm temperament. Um, some even describe them as kind of dog-like. They're really good about socializing and wanting to stay with their owners and always follow them from room to room. So Alba was actually the first pedigree cat I got. And then after I got him, I had learned more about ragdolls. And that's when I actually got my first ragdoll, which was Drogon. And um, he was a pet that uh, sadly passed about a year ago. But after just getting um, my first ragdoll and then Alba, I really just fell in love with the breed and decided um, this was a breed that I would like to maybe get to start a cattery with. And that's what I've done. Awesome. That's a, that's kind of a story that a lot of us share, like similar to that, where you just fell in love with the breed and that maybe they're like us somehow, like personality wise, you find the connection with certain cats and just, I don't know, become obsessed. That's how I feel about mine for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I was watching, you have an awesome social media presence. You're you have TikTok channel, which at the end will tell everybody how to find you on social media so they can follow you. Um, but I was watching your YouTube channel and you had an awesome video that was explaining about the different colors and I guess categories for the ragdolls. I want to make sure I'm saying it right because, you know, I know how to say it about, you know, the Maine Coons, but um, there's traditional and then there's another category that maybe isn't considered so much traditional. I thought that was interesting and we're kind of seeing the same thing in the Maine Coon breed. They're like new colors coming in and isn't always accepted as the breed standard. So I, I thought that was kind of similar, but can you tell us like the difference between the traditional ragdoll colors and the ones that you're mentioning, the mink, the sepia and the solids? Yeah. So with the ragdolls, um, the traditional colors is what is accepted by both the International Cat Association and the Cat Fanciers Association, um, which are the major associations uh, here in the U.S. And those are accepted as the standard colors. So if you have a traditional ragdoll, you would be able to show your cat if they have show rights, whereas the mink, sepia, and solid colors, they are still accepted by both associations where they can be registered, but you can't show them. So that's kind of the big difference is whether or not you can show them and whether or not they follow the standard. A bit, An easy way to tell the difference is all of the traditional uh, ragdolls will have blue eyes and they will also be pointed and born where they're all white, whereas the mink, sepia, and solid, they're kind of born with colors um, when they're first born and then they darken even more as they get older. Interesting. 
so they can be registered with the associations. Are they working on during cat shows, like getting these colors accepted yet? Is that something that's progressing for the breed or is it not made it that far yet? I think that they probably aren't going to accept these colors, probably not anytime soon because the mink sepia and solid colors actually started at the same time as the traditional, um, I believe back in like the 1960s, but they still haven't accepted them in the uh, standard. So I feel like both the cat associations are probably just going to stick with the same standard. Right. Okay. And then let's talk about the DNA testing that ragdolls need prior to breeding. I know that most pedigree animals have their, their share of health issues that they're known for. Not that all the cats have health issues, but that the breeds are typically known for. And that as pedigree breeders, we can do DNA tests to hopefully pre-screen the cats a little better and look for those genetic markers and look for negative tests. What, what are the ones that that um, ragdolls are tested for before you breed them? Okay, so yeah, whenever I do genetic testing, I usually get a kit in the mail and I'll swab one of my cats and then send that off to be tested. Um, the main things with ragdolls that we're testing for is HCM and PKD, we'll test for both those. And then they'll also test for a bunch of other genetic issues that may show up in ragdolls. Also, it's great because when you get that test back, it will also tell you the coat color of your cat, which you definitely want to know to be able to determine which color your kittens will end up being once you breed a certain cat with a certain male or female. Okay. And what, what company do you like for the DNA testing? I know there's a couple out there, even some new ones. Which one do you, which one do you like? I actually use Optimal Selection, which if you're a uh, international cat association member, you can actually get 15% off their DNA kits. That's who I use too. And they used to have this really cool digital display of their DNA test and they've changed it now. It's just PDF, but I, I think that they are going to go back to their it was a very beautiful, colorful, like interactive visual <laughs> type of navigation around the testing. But I do like optimal selection. I hear sometimes there could be false negatives or false positives, but you know, that's probably with any DNA test. I don't know. That's another episode. I actually want to get somebody from optimal selection and, and base camp and maybe even UC Davis to like, tell us what are the odds that sometimes you might make a mistake. And I'm only saying that because I got a cat tested prior to receiving her. So she was tested before she ever arrived and she had negative PK deficiency testing. And then I always test again when I get them from optimal selection and I tested her again and she came up positive for PK deficiency. So which one's right? Which one is wrong? You know, I got two yeah. different tests and I don't know, you know, I know with humans, DNA is pretty spot on, but that just yeah. kind of raised some concern for me. Like how much, how much accuracy are we getting? Anyway, that's another, that's another one. I'm going to, I'm going to work on that because that's a, just an interesting Yeah, uh, topic. That would be a great episode. I think. Yep. Okay. So let's talk about your cageless cattery. So I know you started out a couple of years ago, just with your first ragdoll. So um, how many breeding cats do you have up to this point? I'm actually still a pretty small cattery because I started in 2019 and I've only had two litters so far, um, but about to have my third one. I have that was my cat. <laughs> uh, I have two females currently and I have one male. I know the goal is to try and get three females for every male and I actually almost had that but I decided to retire one of my females early because she just didn't seem to enjoy being a mother as much so yeah. I'm still trying to reach that three females for every male just Going at a slow pace though. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the best way. And you have your cattery in your home or do you have a separate building and maybe do you have plans for a separate building in the future? How do you feel about, you know, however the setup is you have now? I have all of my cats that live with me in my home. So I do an in-home cattery. I think in the future, I'll probably stick with that uh, style as well, but hope to expand and get a bigger house so I can have more rooms to set up and devote to the cattery. Man, it's all about the space, isn't it? 
It really is. Yeah. <laughs> it is all about the space. Okay, so since they do live in your home, this takes me right into the next question about how do you keep your male separate from your females when they're in heat? I know they probably get along fine when they're not in heat, but once it's time, what do you do with your male if you're not ready to mate the girl, of course? You know, how do you handle that yeah. situation? So I have a room that is dedicated to my a uh, male cat that I'll put him in there when either of my females are in heat. Um, he also stays in there usually if um, I'm away and don't know like when, because sometimes you know females can go into heat when you may not expect it. So he usually spends most of his time in there, but also I let him out when I'm home because I want him to still get to interact with the others and get to go outside on my catio that I have for them. So that's kind of how I have set up my situation with him awesome yep and that seems to work right just um you know he has his own little room and he's happy in there now does your male spray he usually does not he doesn't actually spray very often only when she's in heat so that actually right. works out good so it's like only when he's in that one room right that's good at least he's not like a hoser and <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so how about your kittens so where do you have like your nursery set up? Do they have their own room? And how do you move through the different phases of the kitten life? Like, you know, they start out in the little birth box and then they kind of graduate until basically they're running bonkers everywhere. How do you, how do you transition them through their different phases of life? So they don't have their own room, but I have a uh, playpen for them that I will move to different locations whenever I want them to uh, maybe stay downstairs in my living room area, or sometimes I'll move the playpen upstairs into the same room that Ghost is in, and they will stay in there with him sometimes. But I move that playpen, and that's kind of their stages of life. So when they're younger, they stay in the kitten box, and then they, when they can like explore more but haven't been litter trained, they can go out into the playpen area, but they don't leave the playpen area until they're actually litter trained. Yes. Oh, yes, honey. And is that your play <laughs> is your playpen? Um, is it clearly love pets? It is. Yeah. One of I, my favorite brands for sure. Yeah, I saw that on your YouTube videos. Like, oh, uh, I love them. They're just, they're just beautiful. And I've contemplated ordering them. I've had it in my cart, like uh, more <laughs> times than not. I just haven't, I haven't tried the clearly of pets yet. Are they able to jump out of that? Is there a certain age where like they can get out? I don't think the kittens could ever. Maybe if you put like a little short cat tree in there, then they could jump on that and then jump right. out. My adult cats can, but even they have difficulty sometimes. Yeah. Do you have the medium one or the large one? I did the medium one, which I believe is 27 inches tall. Uh-huh. Yeah. I was wondering about that. I, I love those. I think they're all, I've even asked my son, like, do you think you can make me one of these? Like, <laughs> I like the clear plexiglass, you know, that you can yes. see them all the time. That's, they're nice. No, yeah. When you have to move that, is, how is it to move? Like when you're using the Clearly Love Pets pen, is it simple or... It's a little difficult, but not too bad. Um, so it's really sturdy. So I usually break it into two parts, like down the center. And that's yeah. how I move like one half and then the other half. Okay. If I was going to take it completely apart, it would take a while. Right. Because then you'd have to undo like every panel. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Okay. I'm going to be back putting that in my cart again, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So far, what do you think are the top three must-haves for your cattery? So I would say my number one is definitely the litter robots. Um, have you gotten any of those before? Yep, yep, yep. I'm on the litter robot train, yep. Those make my life so much easier. Uh, just not having to scoop litter all the time, having so many cats, like that's definitely my number one must have. I would say, since we also just talked about it, I would say the playpen that I have for the kittens is a must have, just because I don't have a separate room for the kittens yet. Yeah. Yep. Um, that's definitely a must have just to keep them contained in a small area. Yes, yeah, awesome. And then the third thing is definitely some cat trees. My cats love just being able to jump up them, lay and nap on them, be able to be up tall. So definitely cat trees is my number three. Awesome, awesome. Okay, we'll talk about the favorite subject. Do you offer kittens with breeding rights? 
And what are your requirements for that if you do? I do offer kittens with breeding rights. I haven't sold one yet, but some of my requirements would be that they would have to be cageless cattery as well. I think that's very important just to give the cats the best quality of life as a breeder cat. Also, they would have to be registered either with TICA or CFA, at least one of the associations they would have to be registered with. Um, they would also have to keep the cat indoor only. They could go outside only if they're supervised. And those are probably the main things. And then also the last thing is practice early spay and neuter or mm -hmm. have in their contract where they require the pet to be spayed or neutered at a certain right. time. Awesome. And what advice do you have for anyone new who is thinking about starting a cattery for the very first time? Definitely number one thing is to do your research, not only in how to start the cattery and breed cats specifically, but you also really need to research the specific breed you are wanting to start the cattery for and make sure you know all about the colors and their traits, you really know what you're getting into. Also, it's really helpful to find a mentor and you can find those um, I think TICA actually has a program where you can um, be matched with a mentor or you can maybe go to like some Facebook groups. I know there's some Facebook groups that will also help you answer questions or maybe find a mentor that way. And then also maybe a third method would be whoever you get your breeder cats from, don't be afraid to reach out to them and ask them if they would be willing to mentor you through the process. Right. Good advice. Awesome. Pearl. Well, tell us um, before we close how we can find you on your social media channels. I know you're on multiple ones, but you do such a good job at your videos and, and delivering the information about the breed. I love it. Tell us where to find you on social media. Yeah, you can find me at Pearl's Ragdolls. Uh, that is my username for YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. Pretty much all my social accounts are Pearl's Ragdolls. And then if you want to email me, you can also email me at pearl at pearlsragdolls.com. Awesome. Very good. Well, again, I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to share and let, let us have a peek into your life as a breeder of ragdolls. I appreciate it so much. And yeah, thank you so much, April. I'm really excited for being able to be your first guest. Thank you for listening to the Cat Breeder Sensei Says podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. I'll see you next time.